Welcome back to the Missing Maura Murray podcast. I am Tim here with Lance. Lance, how goes it? It goes pretty well. How are you, sir? Doing well. We're five in, five episodes out of six Oxygen Series episodes in. Man, that went by fast. We have one left. We have one left next week. Same time, same place, Oxygen Network, 7 p.m. If you miss it at 7, you can catch it at 9, but we're still doing the uh, after show on our Facebook, the after show, the Facebook Live uh, on the Missing More Murray uh, Facebook page. And last week's Facebook Live episode, which we will play in just a minute, we covered a lot. The episode itself was, um, well, I keep saying it, it knocked my socks off. Like, I had to buy new socks that night. It was a pretty wild episode, and yes, you're right, uh, we are going to play the Facebook Live audio that we recorded on Saturday night immediately after the first airing of episode 5, and if you happen to watch on YouTube, you are going to get a three-camera extravaganza for this uh, for this podcast episode. Um so if you want to check that out, you'll get full video of me and Lance. And uh, we also have on guests who are on the show, Maggie Freeling, obviously, and Art Roderick, the lead investigators on this show. They do join us in uh, in this audio that we're about to play. Yep. So wanted to thank Art and Maggie. Wanted to thank Josh Leonard, our camera guy who uh, orchestrated that, uh, like you said, that extravaganza, that three camera extravaganza. And I wanted to thank everybody who who participated in the Facebook live chat room. And also check us out for a Reddit Ask Us Anything uh, deal that we're doing with Oxygen on Reddit at 6 p.m. on Saturday if you're on reddit frequently check us out okay so if we're ready tim let's toss it over to the facebook live uh after show that we did uh last saturday with art and maggie great check us out on twitter at maura murray doc and on facebook also at maura murray doc and we will be back on facebook live at 805 p.m on saturday after the finale for another live show with me and Lance and potentially more special guests. So check us out. We will be Facebooking and tweeting with updates about that. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are. I am Tim, here with Lance. We are of the Missing Mora Murray podcast. We're talking tonight about Oxygen's episode five of The Disappearance of Mora Murray. A pretty wild episode, if I do say so myself. Yes. Holy shit. Right? Yes. Is it, this was a holy shit episode, right? Absolutely. And thank you, everybody, for joining in on this. We'll take your questions um, at uh, the best pace possible. Uh, and we will try to uh, answer them with the most amount of accuracy as possible. There was a lot of info to process tonight. A lot going on. We got notes. Uh, we got pages of notes. And we're also going to have Maggie Freeling and Art Roderick on tonight to talk about what's going on uh, in episode five. Uh, so Maggie should be calling in in about four minutes. So, Lance, what do you want to cover before we hear from Maggie? I guess the most fascinating part about the whole episode, at least to me, was that we have a new hero in the show, which is uh, the search dogs, the the new heroes in this in, in this show. The search dogs were amazing. Yeah. And I think that they absolutely I wouldn't say I'm sorry. They they ninety nine point nine percent ruled out any notion that Mora walked into the woods, died of either hypothermia or was. I guess uh, attacked and 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 devoured by some animal, right? I, they they ruled out Mora being in the woods in some form, with the extensive dog uh, stuff that they did here in this episode. Yeah, I would agree. It it did seem like they completely ruled out 
uh, certain things tonight, that's for sure. Right. They gave a really cool stat about the dog scent being between 10,000 and 100,000 times more uh, acute than the human scent. Right. And that just shows you even that gap there, 10,000 to 100,000, shows you the, the you just don't know. Like these dogs can sniff out anything. Well, yeah, what we were saying in between commercials there or during commercials was that we, you know, we can't even relate to how the dogs smell. It's not even possible for us to comprehend how well these dogs smell. We can't even say that it's comparable to any one of our senses as humans. Right. And say their smell is like equivalent to what we fill in the blank. Yeah. It's like superhuman. Sticking with the dogs, let's um, let's just stick with that subject here. So they Ma- maggie and art tonight they went they had cadaver dogs in there and mostly based on a comment uh or you know a bunch of comments things people thought about um could mara be found if she was frozen they tested that and they had a cadaver dog test a frozen placenta in the woods about a half a mile away from where they were and the dog found the trace right within five and a half minutes right and and you really need to think about the things that have been put online uh regarding whether or not a body will freeze and you're not able to smell it right and you're talking before that you think about it in the sense of like you're a human being going into the woods and do i smell something funny like a human you know like something decomposing uh that's just the human element of it um if a body goes in, if, if someone dies in the woods and it is it is freezing, the body is still at body temperature, and then it and then the body temperature drops, mm-hmm. and then the temperature outside rises, and then the body temperature continues to drop. So at some point there has to be some sort of like balance there, and and when that happens, they already had the dogs on the site. Yeah, they already had the dogs going into the woods. And it didn't matter. It wouldn't have mattered if Mora went into the woods and died and then had some animal, you know, start. I don't want to get too graphic, but you know what I'm getting at. Mm. The dogs would have found something. They showed the radius. So it's, 12 it's miles of road was the radius they showed um, right. for, with, 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 the, with the cadaver dogs. Um, at first, it was, it was a 10-mile radius around. So if the crash site is in the middle there, it goes five miles around every... Am I reading that right? As far as the, the radius goes, the di- that's what the diagram looked like. Right, exactly. Okay. So essentially five miles in every direction from the accident site is where they... The radius was... Uh, is the radius that was covered by yep. the cadaver dogs. Yep. Yep, that, 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 seems, to be, that seems to be accurate. And uh, Todd... What was his last name? I forget his last name. The original tracker. Yeah, he was great though. The the uh, the the ranger. Mm-hmm. Um, fishing game, yeah. Fishing game, right? He, he, what what he said was 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 remarkable, right? With the distance that they covered, uh, the amount of for the amount of cases that he's worked on, out of hundreds, he has two that are still open. One yeah. of them is Morris. Yeah. If he was going to find somebody in the woods, if they were in the woods, this is the guy who was going to find them. And he ran three searches. Three searches. Three more searches. One with seven dog teams is what they said tonight. Right. Seven dog teams. This is a guy, and I just want to read reiter- just seven dogs. Seven, seven dog, dog teams. teams. Right. <laughs> I, I And just to be redundant and reiterate this, he's put to bed hundreds of cases except for two. So what does that tell you? Makes you wonder what the other one is. Right. But what does that tell you? She's not in the woods. Her remains are not in the woods. It it really does seem like that. Yeah. Todd Bogardis. Todd Bogardis. Well done. Thank you, Tasha. From Sylvie, will the Loon Mountain 3 ever be interviewed? Uh, Tough question to answer. Um... I would say stay tuned and I don't know. I, you know, I guess the question is, are they, uh, are you referencing, um, are they to be interviewed by Maggie and art or interviewed by law enforcement from Amanda? Where are the a frame brothers? Now the a frame brothers, uh, Claude and Larry, they are 
Well, le- le- <laughs> it's a dicey situation. <laughs> well, we to talk know for we, we know for a fact that Larry's dead. Larry you, you is can, dead. You can easily we, look we're that pretty up. sure Larry's dead. <laughs> right, I'm, right. But Claude is not, even though he's been spreading the, that rumor. Or maybe not spreading the rumor, but he's he's definitely uh, he definitely hasn't refuted that rumor. Yeah. Okay, from Holly, best episode yet. So many emotions. Uh, right, exactly, and and we just have one left, so you have to wonder what's about to happen. Everything just kind of came to a head so fast yeah. in the last two episodes. Yeah. So we believe the police about the accident site, but apparently they didn't examine the A-frame house. Uh, that's. A possibility. Alex says, whoever called Karen was more likely either Cecil himself or Jeff Williams, yet they can't explain why she would have been called back to clarify that point. And here is Maggie. Maggie Freeling. calling in. What is up, Maggie? Hi. Hi, Maggie. Hello. What an episode. What an episode. Can you hear us okay? I can hear you great. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, you are on Facebook Live right now. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so, uh, what a crazy episode, right? Totally crazy. Um, you know, it's one of the episodes that I haven't watched many, many times in the editing process. So it was actually kind of surprising to see some of the stuff that was in it again. It takes a real tonal shift near the end. Am I wrong about that? <sighs> It definitely does. Um, And watching that that scene is absolutely crazy because it was a shock to Art and me too. um, You're talking that there was human blood on the chips. So we're we're talking about that last scene where you pull the piece of uh, the piece of paneling or the piece of wood out of uh, the bag, and that piece of paneling was taken from. Here's my questions. Uh, Here are my questions. Uh, That piece of paneling was taken from where? And are it's it's basically confirmed that that's human. Yes. Okay. And, and were the pan, was that, was that sample taken from um, the floor from upstairs or from the closet underneath the stairs in the A-frame house? It was taken from the closet, the wall of the closet. The wall of the closet upstairs? Upstairs or or downstairs? downstairs? Oh, Jesus. Uh, there was multiple closets. I do not remember. Okay, I'm pretty sure it's downstairs. Uh, and I heard from John this week, John Smith, that, uh, that that those were the only chips that he had that he gave were the ones yeah. from downstairs. So they were from the walls of the closet downstairs. Yes. So you're starting to, you know, we, I know in my head, I'm starting to paint a picture of uh, something really dark that that may have happened um so okay so we're saying that there was human blood found on the walls of the closet in the a-frame house of the downstairs closet of the a-frame house that's what we're saying i yeah i guess it's uh i guess we can say like regardless of where it was found there's human blood enough human blood that was on a wall in the house of the man whose brother gave an alleged bloodstained knife to Fred and said, my brother had something to do with your daughter's disappearance. Fred gave that knife to the New Hampshire State Police. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And let me let me just say, so when John gave us the chips, he had um, a typed up statement from the owner of the house at the time yep. stating why the owner uh, was suspicious. So the owner... Um, it was his summer house. This was in 2014, I believe. It was his summer house, and he had heard all the rumors about the house and, I guess, heard that the dogs had hit in the closet, so he obtained some luminol. I, he worked in a lab somewhere, yeah. so he obtained some uh, luminol, sprayed it in the closet, and said that the entire closet lit up. Yeah. Um, yes. And we were actually worried that because the chips had been luminols before that we wouldn't get um, any kind of result, but we did. And so that was very, very surprising. Pretty, pretty wild. So, yeah, he's a law, correct, a law enforcement corrections officer, this guy, the former owner of the A-frame house. Um, and so this was on uh, the anniversary of Moore's disappearance in 2016 that this happened, that we went into the house. And uh, I think it was a couple of days later that John got the chips from the downstairs closet. If 
If you're a fan of Missing Maura Murray, you probably love true crime podcasts just like me. But what about cults? Mystery, manipulation, murder? Cults are associated with all of these. But what really goes on inside a cult? More specifically, what is the psychology behind cults and what goes on inside the minds of people who join cults and leaders who start them? And what is their story? If this interests you like it interests us, well, let us recommend a new podcast. It's called Cult, and Cult answers all of these questions and more. Each episode of Cults aims to explore the biographical profile of a cult's leader or leaders and how people can be persuaded and manipulated to not only join a cult but commit horrible crimes. Now, the hosts of Cults analyze evidence. They share real audio tapes, which is completely fascinating, from cult leaders and the members. The cult's team of researchers brings to light little-known facts about each cult as they analyze their story. Episodes you should check out. They cover the Manson family. They cover Heaven's Gate. Check those out now. And with a new episode coming out every Tuesday, you can expect episodes on the People's Temple and many more. Visit Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts and search for cults. Again, that's C-U-L-T-S. Or visit parcast.com slash cults to start listening now. Now that's parcast, P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com slash cults to listen now. Colin Art now, former U.S. Marshal Art Roderick, who is on The Disappearance of Maura Murray on Oxygen Show. We are currently on the line with Maggie Freeling, investigative journalist from The Disappearance of Maura Murray on Oxygen. Art, how's it going? Hey, how are you guys doing? Great. Good, good. Can everyone hear each other? Yeah, I can hear Art. Okay, cool. Great. Hey, Maggie. Art, right, what did you think of episode five? Um, you know, the one thing that, 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 that's frustrating, to, I think probably both Maggie and I, I don't want to speak for Maggie, but we've had conversations about this before, is usually everybody that we interviewed, we sit there for an hour and a half. And, and there's probably a total of 300 hours of either Maggie and I talking to one another or interviews that we've taped and what you see is, is like two to three minutes, which are the highlights of each interview. But a lot of that inform, a lot of information is kind of lost because of editing. So, right. what, so what, what is it that you would like to add that you think was lost uh, of importance tonight? I mean, when, when we look at, at uh, the Cecil's interview, I mean, we did ask the question about, and, and, and Jeff Williams' interview, we did ask, Jeff Williams, where he was that evening. He said he was out to dinner in Woodsville um, and uh, never went by the crash site. And when we, you know, when we look at all these interviews put together, when we look at Cecil's interview, we look at Jeff Williams' interview, um, you know, we know statements that have been made by um, the Westons, by the Marats, by the Atwoods. I mean, there's absolutely nothing that points to the fact that Jeff Williams was at the scene that night. And I think that's an important point. Uh, because when we started this, you know, we wanted to get down to facts and corroborate everybody's statements. And I think that's what we did uh, throughout every one of these episodes. Right. Which has been um, some of the most impressive uh, elements to Tim and myself, which is how you, you guys literally wrote out the five scenarios and, and cross them off just based on the, the realisticness of each one. Um, that's, uh, that, that, that's, that's the way these investigations should be carried out. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, even, even when Maggie and I were sitting there and talking about him, we crossed them out, but they're, they're I mean, because we don't exactly know what happened, we crossed them out based on the probability of what occurred. 
Um, so, and, and we had a long discussion about every one of those, uh, every, every one of those possibilities. And I think we are fairly confident that we narrowed it to probably the most probable thing that happened to Mora. Getting to that, one of the more impressive, uh, we, we had started this episode or we started the live, uh, after show by saying that one of the more impressive moments is watching the search dogs, the cadaver dogs and the tracking dogs do their work. Um, I know Mag- yeah. Maggie, I know you're a, a, a huge animal fan, a huge dog fan. Um, and it was clear that you guys had a, uh, an, an instant rapport, um, with the, uh, with the dogs. Uh, I just want, can you talk us through that? Because one of the things that we, that that's always out there is how Morris scent goes missing about a hundred yards from the car. And it's up at the top of that little crest right there by Bradley Hill road and across from, or right in between uh, Butch Atwood's house and Rick Forcier's house. And it just poof disappears. Right. And we keep saying that, that she just disappeared into thin air to see the dog do their work and then actually sit down and look up and say, it's gone. The scent's gone. A lot of people have have speculated and theorized that, you know, maybe it was Butch or maybe it was Rick Forcier because he's right across the street. If there was any scent going to either of those directions, those dogs would have gone in that direction, right? Yeah, um, that's the thing. I mean, it was always a possibility. After we heard Strelzen say, like, you can walk over, you know, a body. I've done it many times on the scene. I was like, okay, maybe you can. Like, I've never been out looking for a body. I don't know. But um, watching the dogs and knowing how many dogs they had searching for Mora in those woods, uh, there is no question in my mind she is she is not in those woods, in that area. I mean, we buried that placenta, and it took him virtually no time to find it. Yes. And he was Five on and it a half in minutes. freezing cold conditions. Yeah, freezing cold conditions. The wind was absolutely insane. Like, we could barely film that day because it was so cold. And he was able to find those remains and in no time. Um, and the scent dog, too. I mean, tracking scent, it, it's like, how does this work? But somehow it does. I mean, it works. He tracked my scent. And I was in winter clothes. I was covered up. And somehow that dog tracked me to the exact spot that I got in the car. I wanted to ask you about about the gloves that you let the dog smell, um, because it has been long reported that Mora maybe only wore the pair of gloves that the dog smelt, uh, that maybe she only wore them once, and that was the pair of gloves that the dogs smelt uh, the scent of Mora. So how many times did you wear the gloves that the dog smelt for you? They weren't new, um, but they weren't old, and I had probably only worn them a few times that winter. Um, and we also asked about that to the scent person, um, and that's also something that we're not totally sure. I know Fred s- thinks that was the case, um, but we also don't know. Okay. But um, we did ask about that, and if she had worn those gloves one time, her scent would have been on them. So it seems like that's almost a mute mute point at this point at this point yeah um so i think you know that dog traced her a hundred yards down the road to that spot i think that's where she was and i want to make another point too um that was not made clear in the show is when we come to the conclusion that the most likely scenario is murdered i would add to that abducted and held captive it is not we don't know what happened we know she was abducted and we all know about ariel castro and those girls being found over a decade later um if that is also a possible situation we don't actually know that she was murdered but um we have concluded that somebody took her against her will art how how do you feel about this In, in your experiences is this i mean obviously this isn't a common thing but this is something that happens right yeah, I mean, and, and just to add one comment on the dogs, I mean, I, when I was with the U.S. Marshals, I uh, was the assistant director, and uh, the dog, the canine program that the Marshal Service had was under me, but it was an explosive dog, uh, EOD-type bomb dog, and I have seen those dogs in action, and it just absolutely blows me away that they're able to find a tiny amount of explosive 
in a parking lot of three to 400 cars. So the scent dogs, the dogs that are trained to pick up on either uh, human remains, um, scent, or EOD, they're, they're, just, they're just absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal investigative tools to have at your, at your service. And, and, and it, you know, listening to Lieutenant Bogart has talked about the extensive search they did, uh, both Maggie and I were pretty impressed by the whole thing. Yeah, so the show, um, the show got into the serial killer angle for a little bit, yes. and it was a very impressive uh, segment. Really, like they showed, um, they 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 showed uh, Israeli keys and right. how he, uh, you know, meticulously plotted his victims and called New Hampshire his stomping ground, and and then they they did a 180 and went to the A-frame house. I want to back up a little bit and talk about the possibility that it was someone like an Israeli Keys who would plot out their their victims in such a meticulous way. Is that a possibility that is uh, at any level reasonable at this point? Or is it what Fred said, a local dirtbag? I mean, I see someone writing, it doesn't have to be a serial killer, and that's absolutely true. It does not have to be a serial killer at all. It could be any opportunist killer. Um, so that person is absolutely correct. And he, Israel Keyes, uh, the, the police do believe that he had uh, a few more murders that he had not confessed to. Um, so he is still, it, it's still possible. There has never been a connection made. And Israel Keyes' M.O. was... was you know, mainly he would never find the body. He would put it in the deepest lake in the area and have, you know, these plans worked out years in advance. So, uh, I mean, is it a possibility? It's always a possibility. Serial killers kill people. I mean, but, you know, the odds of that occurring are very, very slim, but it's still got to be on the chart because, you know, in talking to, uh, you know, the state police, they don't, they're, they're in the same boat we are. They, they're looking at a list of probabilities. And, and I think they, they believe what we believe and what the family believes that, you know, that there was abduction and possibly foul play. Um, you know, I think even in Julie's interview, she, she dreams about poor Mora being held captive somewhere and not being able to contact the family. Right. And it, it's a good point by um, uh, what you had noticed uh, about the, the wording, the, the classification of serial killer versus somebody who just seized an opportunity. And right. that's something that is uh, just kind of flown off the handle a little bit in the years is that people say an opportunistic serial killer. And I know Maggie just said it, but the more we can say that you know, no one's saying a serial killer. No one's really said, like, they bring up Israeli keys um, because he said New Hampshire was a stomping ground. Chilling. And it is chilling, yeah. right? But whatever happened to Mora at that 100 yards from the crash site was an opportunity. And, right. and don't play so loosely with serial killer. It was an opportunity. Right. Leave it at that. And then go right. from there. You know how hard it is to find the right candidates, Lance? I mean, how many experiences have you had where you were hiring and you just couldn't find the person for the job? I can't even tell you the amount of times that me personally and you and I have both been looking for the right candidate for the job. Someone smart, uh, someone who is able to keep the business moving forward, and we just can't seem to find the right platform to, to, to recruit. But with ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards with just one click. So you can rest easy knowing your job is being seen by the right candidates. Then ZipRecruiter puts its smart matching technology to work, actively notifying qualified candidates about your job within minutes of posting so you receive the best possible matches. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other hiring sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on the right candidates finding you. It finds them. 
No wonder 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. So find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by growing businesses of all sizes and industries to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, our listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash MMM. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash MMM. One more time, to try it for free, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash MMM. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Okay, so l- let's talk about this A-frame house connection. And uh, so it's been reported that dogs hit um, in, in a major way uh, in the upstairs closet. So, w- all right, what what the hell? And 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 Maggie, what the hell? Blood was found on the walls of the downstairs closet. Is what? If that's what the fuck? Hold on a second. Is human blood found on the walls of the downstairs closet? Am I crazy? Am I taking crazy pills here? Or did something really terrible happen in that house? Yeah, if it's even if it's not Morris blood, which you'll have to, you know, wait to see. I mean, someone's blood is in that closet. Whose blood is in the closet? I mean, that's a problem. Somebody there is human there is enough human blood, and I know we've talked about this with you guys, like and that's the thing. It was tested, it is blood. It's not contact DNA. It's blood. It's not spit, it's not sweat. It is human blood on the walls of the closet right so i I remember when we first went into the uh, a-frame house and spoke to the current owners um and the old owners yeah i'm sorry uh let me rephrase that when we went into the a-frame house we spoke to the owners at the time yep um and the overwhelming uh consensus was that if something if, if if it wasn't mora here something happened to somebody and it was bad and it could have been multiple people um mm-hmm. all right you had something to say about about that as well i no, feel like we I, I, might have I cut think you off, that but... that's a part of the next episode so it's hard for us to talk about it sure but as you can see from my reaction at the end i didn't think we were going to find anything on there and not only did we find something but we found human blood as opposed to because we skipped the luminol test, we went right to the phenophthalene thing, which detects human blood. So, and Maggie's right, it's just not touch DNA, it's not, it's not any type of other bodily fluid, it's human blood. It, now, is, do you know, or can you comment on, is this finding in any way related to why the New Hampshire State Police collected Kathleen Murray's DNA, uh, allegedly about a month ago? That, you know, there's something else that that's going to there's going to be we're going to talk about that in the next episode of the final episode, because we we uh, kind of go over everything that's occurred up to this point. And and I think when you see what we talk about, all that will make sense at the end. Um, I know it's kind of a cryptic answer. I, Maggie, if you want to add something to it, I, I, I think it'll all make sense in the end. Okay, and uh, we it was uh, stated that the A-frame house had undergone some renovations. Uh, have have there has there been any movement on your end, Art and Maggie, uh, either speaking to or visiting uh, the A-frame house, speaking to whoever is owning it right now, um, and also have you talked to any of the uh, Moltons? We um, can't really answer that, <laughs> to be honest. Okay. Um, but there, there have been people that have been spoken to, um, and the police are following up on for sure. Uh, can, can we get a couple of house housekeeping things out of the way? Some questions from the last episode, uh, something that I messed up in, in the last podcast episode. Uh, can you guys tell us which way John Monahan entered the accident scene from? West. Yeah, he, he, go ahead. Yeah. He came from the West to the East. Okay. So he came from the West and then he went back and searched West. Right. And we asked him why he went west, and he said because 
that looks like the direction somebody would run. There are things that way. There's a gas station that way. There are houses that way. If you go east, there is absolutely nothing. It is pitch black in the wilderness. Now, if I were him, I probably would have turned around too. And to to um, to be totally clear, the direction you're speaking of is opposite the direction of where her scent was lost by the dogs. Yes. Okay, so yeah. the way he searched was opposite from the way that the dog said that she went. Right, which occurred a couple of days later. It's not like he knew the dog scent ended. Oh, right, no, right, totally, right. totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you're showing the map on for, for the viewers, when you see that overhead shot, just to establish here's where she, uh, where here's where the scent went missing, Monaghan searched the other way. But in, right. in no way saying that he did it intentionally. There's no way he could have known that at the time. Right. Yeah. But, like, you know, let's also, let's not forget, too, because, I mean, you have to put this complete package together. And you do have Karen McNamara heading east. And she didn't see anything. That's that's very true, right? She yeah. She was on her way from the west going east. And right. and should have come upon somebody walking after she had passed the crash or scene. or jogging or, or running right exactly and, and she's right. been proven to be a credible witness so if she yeah. saw that she would yeah. have reported that absolutely. absolutely and she didn't so we know Mora was not going east or at least we nobody had seen her walking that way right uh wow. Okay. Um, okay, another house uh, housekeeping note here. Is there evidence proving law enforcement's claim that Cecil Smith drove SUV 001 that night? Yes, there is. Um, they have told me that they are that they can 100 percent confidently say that Cecil Smith was in the SUV and responded to the scene in 001 and investigated the car accident in the SUV 001. There's multiple um, pieces of yeah. evidence proving that, not just one, there's multiple. Pieces of evidence proven that Cecil Smith was driving SUV 001. There's yes. evidence that they're confident that he was in that vehicle and they actually it did, did some investigation based on Karen McNamara's statement. Great. Yes, and people are wondering, yeah. I think you know, or this is another say. housekeeping thing. Um, people are really uh, up in arms about why did the police call Karen back and ask if she was sure she saw SUV 001? So, yeah, what, why why was she called back? Uh, do you know that, uh, Art? It, uh, it could have been as simple as double-checking the information she gave. I mean, they had... I mean, she saw what she saw, and there was nothing to to um, to dispute anything that law enforcement found. I mean, to them, it was just an eyewitness statement that was correct. Mm. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that have been said that fall into this myth, rumor, innuendo category that were never, ever corroborated. Um and the only thing we have evidence to show, uh, you know, that the only thing that's been corroborated is the fact that Cecil was there in 001. You talk to Cecil, right? You have witnesses. You have Karen McNamara going by seeing the SUV there. So, I mean, that's the bottom line. I, I, I You know, people are going on and on and on about SUV 001. Well, guess what? You know, they want to say that Kara McNamara is right. Well, she is. But you can't, on the other hand, say she's wrong. Right. And that somebody else was there. So, you know, Cecil Smith was in SUV 001 and responded to the accident scene. Karen McNamara did see him twice because he cut down a side road that was easier to travel on and come back up by French Pond. And she saw him again. And he responded to the accident scene at that time. So what she saw was what she saw. Okay, and I think that is, uh, I, I think that's a, that that goes, um, that's relatable to a lot of the, uh, the the 
items of this case, these elements, these red herrings, that if you just look at it at face value and don't think conspiracy every single time, there's a very reasonable explanation for everything. Here's another one that's really frustrating and it's laughable because even Karen says, or Karen doesn't say, Karen never said she was told the SUV was out of commission. That is something people need to stop just believing rumor. That was never said. That was never said. Right. Okay. Karen right. never even said that. Right. That's right. something that 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 generates and it starts to snowball and and it becomes fact after a while and that's right. what you guys have been doing such a good job at eliminating. Um, are these uh, are these these um, these these you know graduated theories that just are just based on someone's theory in the past and it's and it's written out there and then it becomes truth right so, um, so a- alex exactly. alex posted this one on youtube that he asked karen about this and he says uh karen herself was never directly told by police that 001 was out of commission um that she had a family member who was a journalist that was looking into the case and karen's account and it was this person who was told that the vehicle was out of commission and that is something I it's think... a bad game of telephone. Yeah, it's a yeah, bad yeah. game of telephone with somebody's life involved. Yep. I mean, it's ho- it's horrible. The rumors people will believe. And it's gotten so bad over 13 years. And... I mean, you, you need to look at evidence and facts. Speaking of rumors, um, we want to uh, we, we want to um, touch upon real quick or however long you want. Um, you finally got to speak with Jeff Williams and Jeff Williams appearance tonight at least in my mind, made a certain impression. Uh, first, he was huge. I had no idea that Jeff Williams was physically that big. Yeah, what is he, 6'5 or yeah, something? Is he like, Looks like a he, wrestler. He's yeah. huge. He's, he's like he's a big guy. Art, art's massive. <laughs> yeah. I, I love um, he, also, he also has a really expressive face and personality and the second he started speaking with you guys, I wanted to know what is their impression of this guy? You know, he seems like he cleaned himself up. I mean, he was very nice. Um, He wanted to talk. We knew from the beginning he wanted to talk. I mean, since the, what was it, the anniversary? Yes. He came up to us and said, I would love to talk to you guys for this show. Which is, so it wasn't. So since the vigil okay. or the or the tree ceremony in uh, February, early February of 2017, that's when he came yeah. up to you guys. The, yeah, mm-hmm. he came up to us and said, "I want to talk to you." He, I, he introduced himself and said, "Hey, this is who I am. Um, I know you've been talking to the police, blah blah blah. I want to talk to you guys." And you know, it always has to get cleared. It had to get cleared. Um, and it was hard because I think at one at while all of the police wanted to talk and tell their story. Um, I think the attorney general just didn't want to feed into everybody's like craziness. And I think that's also, again, why they never came back and put to bed this police conspiracy, because that's all it is, is conspiracy. They don't need to be doing PR for themselves. I mean, they know it's not true. So that's that. So right. uh, he, he had to get cleared, but he wanted to talk from the beginning. Let me just say something. And Maggie's brought up a very, very good point. And, and, and from, from my law enforcement perspective, I mean, you know, I've been, this is my 40th year in law enforcement. I can't tell you how many fugitive cases I've done, both domestic and internationally, hundreds of fugitive cases. I've done internal affairs cases. I've done law enforcement shooting reviews and investigations. I've done domestic and international cases. I've interviewed probably thousands of people. And I can tell you that there's only two reasons why on an open criminal case that law enforcement would share information. And they're key reasons why. Public safety and and an extreme case would be something like the Boston Marathon bombing. And number two is limited information release to try to resolve the case. And it's a hard balance because, you, I mean, I can't tell you, I, I have been, I have held stuff very close to my vest on cases and, and not wanted to release anything because I don't want the bad guys to know what I know. So there's this huge balance to be, to be struck between the public's right to know and also to keep the integrity of, of the criminal case in balance. And now what I'm doing, I'm on the other side. I'm on the press side and, and looking for the public's right to know 
but I also have the ability to look back and look what I did for a lot of years and say, listen, there's got to be a balance struck here. There's a lot of stuff they can't share. But I will tell you that I think in this particular case, because this is a cold case, it's gone on for 13 years, that they shared probably a lot of information that they generally wouldn't release to the public mm-hmm. if we weren't doing like a six hour show. Maggie, you said something that he, uh, uh, when you interviewed him, he cleaned himself up. What was, uh, what was that in reference to? Well, I mean, everybody knows about, you know, his, his past with drinking and he got fired. Cecil was actually the one who arrested him. Um, so <laughs> people are all crazy about the cops protect other Cecil, Cecil arrested and ultimately got him fired. So I don't know in what, world protecting William. He, but he, he was, he seems to be doing really well. Um, he was not the person I expected to meet in any sort of way. Um, you know, that's, that's how I feel about him. He talked to us. We had an hour and a half long conversation. Unfortunately, you couldn't see the whole conversation, but that was that. Hour and a half. Did, did he share anything else? What else did he share with us? Yeah, I mean, there was more details about, uh, I'll tell you, there's more details about how badly he felt about the whole thing. And, you know, uh, I think you saw the expression on his face about how could this happen here? How could this happen? And I mean, to me, he came across pretty genuine. Um, You know, he had met uh, the family. He was involved in the search. You know, there was a lot more details about operational stuff at the time uh, that he was involved in. Um, but, I, you know, I, I think when you look at all these law enforcement interviews that we had done is that just about every one of them wanted to get this stuff off their chest and tell their story because they haven't been able to do it prior to this. Right. So do you think it's pretty safe to say that anything that is being broadcast on this show is 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 broadcast in a way where um, – like they're not trying to mislead anybody. My 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 point is is that you spoke to Jeff Williams for um, an hour and a half, and what we see on the show is like four minutes or five minutes. And if there was anything beyond that four or five minutes in that other hour and a half, the show would have followed up on that. The investigation probably would have followed up on that. That's what I feel anyway. And the things that you're seeing now are the things that are 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 in the uh, in the in the in the conversations that don't happen on camera and they're following up on those. Is that a pretty safe assumption to make? Yes, and I, I also think that 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 this was investigated back in the day and that they couldn't find any evidence of of any wrongdoing on his part or the fact that he was even there at the scene, you know, that that evening. Obviously he was there the next 24, 48 hours when they started doing the search, but he was not at the scene that evening. Uh, if you know, if anybody has any other different information, call the state police. I'm telling you, they they have got. They are telling me that they're getting leads in every day. Uh, some of them are old, but they're following up on every single thing they get in. Um, okay, I think we we got to wrap up here in the next five minutes or so. Um, but, uh, do you know if the police ever conducted their own search of the A-frame house? I don't believe they did. I, I don't think they had probable cause at the time to go in there. Everything was just right. really rumor. Okay. I think, I think Maggie's, Maggie's right on. They, I, I don't believe they had probable cause at the time. So what would, uh, what would the, pro- what would probable cause, what would that be? Because they had the brother of the man who claims that they have the brother of the man who resided in the a-frame house who gave the knife to fred and fred gave the knife to the police is there something that we're missing with the well they 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 told you know as far as we know and what we've been told is anything that was given to the state police was tested so not saying it's not mora's blood on the knife i mean it was probably i would say confidently they tested the knife they said anything they were given they tested we did right. ask did you get the knife and i think that was the clip of him saying i can't tell you what we tested and it was cut right. off anything we were given we were tested right. um maybe it just came back inconclusive i mean 
unless it was a full hit on Mora, they would have no cause to go in that house. Somebody saying, I could go and say, Tim, you killed this person, and I know you did. There, That would be absolute abs- insanity if the police got a warrant to search your house. Right. right. Yep, yep. Um, and I, I, I honestly want, like, people, like... I want people to understand that, that when you say probable cause, it's it's more than just, hey, this person said this about this person. Well, but what oh, would no, it... no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you have to fill out an affidavit. The law enforcement officer has to fill out an affidavit and swear to facts and present it to a judge. A judge has to believe that there's, that there's sufficient uh, a probable cause in that affidavit to go ahead and issue a search warrant. Right. And that's a, it's a pretty high level standard to me right so what what would it take to wipe the the knife clean of uh anything i guess more related now if it was just human blood would that have been enough for them to get a warrant to check the a-frame house um i mean it it you know dna nowadays is is it's crazy what they can do i mean there's a there's a bunch of different tests they can do uh, you know, I've seen cases where they've taken the handles off the, the knife itself and found a, a, a speck, not even a speck, but a, a, a pin dot of blood, you know, under the handle of the knife and tested it and they're able to come up with a DNA profile. So, I, you know, I, I, I'm assuming probably there was nothing there. Uh, again, I keep going back to the fact that they don't want to, as much as they've shared with us, they can't share everything. Um, so, uh, you know, we have to, I mean, they're the investigative agency. It's not Haverhill PD. Um, you know, it's, it's the New Hampshire state police cold case unit. They're stationed in Concord and, um, you know, they're, they're pulling everybody in that they can, whether it's the FBI to help out with interviews or other law enforcement agencies, um, which is common in a criminal case. So, uh, it, it just, uh, and Maggie, you can comment on this too, but it's just to me, I feel fairly comfortable with saying that they're doing everything that they possibly can do. I, I have one question. Sure. Um, the promo for next week, it, uh, it, it said that it was going to be a pretty intense episode, you guys. And, uh, there was a clip of Maggie saying is one of them Mora. Can you give us any hint on what you're talking about there? <laughs> uh, all right, can I? <laughs> Tough question. I know. I think. I mean, I think we could. Yeah, if you go ahead. Infer what I'm talking about. <laughs> I think we can. Actually, we shouldn't say, leave that up to the public ahead, because there'll, there'll be some crazy conspiracy theories out there. Right. Right. I, I I wish we could. You know, regardless of what we come up with, even if we came up with a video of what happened. I think there'd be still a lot of people that probably wouldn't believe it uh, and still hold on to whatever theory they have because they're taking what they want to take and poking it into the narrative that they've come up with. But um, but that's but the thing is, is their theories don't matter. What matters is right. when this case gets solved and there is somebody arrested and they go to jail. These if the theories don't right. matter. Evidence matters. Period. Right, right, right. That's a, that's a great point. And it's something that... Uh, that should keep being brought up, which is, which is what you read in the old uh, newspaper clippings, what you what you read uh, online in in certain discussion groups. All of that is is just this generated, uh, inflated narrative that people are coming up with. And yeah. what you're saying is, what matters are the facts and and the scientific DNA evidence and the things that are going on behind the scenes. Now you can read something in the paper that says the father said that she went into the woods to uh, commit suicide. And then you can say, well, uh, the police said that the father said this. And that means now in your head that the police are pushing this narrative. And then there was this ulterior motive, but all you did was read it in an old clipping. And it makes no, you just put everything else, you put the motivation, you put the reasoning, right. that's something you just made up on your own. And yeah. and everything else that's happening in the background, the law enforcement doesn't have to tell anybody anything. We're lucky that's to be right. seeing what we're seeing. Yes, that's exactly correct. That's a, that is the bottom line. I mean, we have to look at everything 
is what is going to get us to the question of what happened to Maura Murray. Everything else is a distraction. And the reason we did this show was to not answer people's crazy conspiracy theories, was to bring attention to Maura and her family and get somebody to talk. And people are talking, and that is amazing and that's why we did this and art and i get lots and lots of leads my inbox is full my facebook is full and it's amazing i mean we both really think that this can be solved and is solvable and that is why we did this and and i just want to add to that if if you are watching or you are listening and you know anything about these people that we're talking about claude these other people uh, the Loon 3, any of these people, you have some stories, message Maggie, message the New Hampshire State Police, message Art, message us. It will get to the right people because someone knows something. And this investigation that you guys have conducted seems to be zeroing in on, uh, well, a, a certain theory at least. And uh, w- when you focus like that, you can start to focus on people, I think. Right. And, and I just want to just... Yeah. Real quick, say the the most impressionable moment of tonight's show was the dog sitting down after losing Maggie's scent exactly where Morris scent wouldn't miss it, uh, where they lost it back in 2004. And and that dog sat right down, right there. Something happened right there. Yeah. And, and you guys have you guys have in less than a year put the disappearance right there. That's where it happened. You can you can yeah. you can speculate all you want. But you can't say that some that a dog scent, which is a hundred mm-hmm. times up to a hundred times more sensitive than a human scent, was wrong that one night. And she went somewhere else. She she went missing right there. She did, and that's the thing. I think all four of us um, can agree. And even yeah. Brenner has mentioned he's maybe changing his theory that uh, she got in a car with somebody and something bad happened. So who is that somebody? We, that's what we need to find out. Who yep. did she, who did she feel comfortable enough to get in a car with, and something happened? <laughs>